I like to say that I don't really have a career. I have more of a careen. I kind of fall into things. <laughs> um, Hi, everyone. I'm Tammy Chaos. And I am Rick Tarosi, and we are mildly interesting people. So because of that, to keep you entertained, we go out of our way every week to find wildly interesting people to chat with. Now, these folks may not be familiar to you, but rest assured, they're famous to us. Kimmy, who is our guest this week? This week, we are joined by Dan Hahn, and there are two important things that I want to talk about here. One of them is that he takes stupid health, mental, stupid walks for his stupid mental health, and I want to get into that. But the other thing that is probably a, a bigger deal and more important is that he is a person who works in technology, but always puts people first. I went and read through his LinkedIn recommendations and reviews, and Dan, <laughs> like every person who's ever worked with you, loves you. You're like a I beloved human. Else. Fantastic. That's how yeah, you, I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, they can't type or talk anymore, so it's it's really hard for them to leave reviews. That's a really good way to approach it. I like it. So, Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, how did it come to be that you worked in technology but were so human-centered? Oh, uh, you're starting with a really easy question there. I am. Yeah, I just um, wanted to like not very work. deep. We're just no. we're surface level here. <laughs> it's only it's like it's like <laughs> ten past eleven in the morning. I've just managed to get the kids out the door, um, uh, and um, and and the kitchen and the dining room is a and I'm hitting bonsai. Hard. Yeah, and, and you're like, okay, so explain your temperament and your life's work. Um, okay, briefly, keep it brief. So I would say the, the sound boring, <laughs> the sound bites, the boring bits are the. Um, I grew up in a um, Asian immigrant middle class family in the UK. So my parents immigrated to the UK from Hong Kong. My my dad and my mum are both academics. Um, so we were very lucky in that I was in the kind of family in the home where my dad would excitedly bring home a computer from work from university, and then so he'd first bring back a BBC microcomputer, um, and then it would be successively bigger and bigger things as his influence and stature and research grants allowed. Um, so it got to the point where, you know, and, and you kind of, I don't know, there are, there are kids and there are people who like this who will just suck up everything around them. And the thing that I had around me to suck up was um, 80s and 90s copies of Byte magazine and PC magazine and being a very, very irritating, precocious young kid who would, you know, break his dad's computer by trying to uh, mess with the auto exec and config.sys to get <laughs> Wing Commander working properly um, <laughs> off pirated floppies. So, so that part is probably, uh, I would say, familiar to a bunch of people who yeah. listen. Um, the other part, I don't know. Um, my wife would say that I am very sensitive and I have big feelings. Um, and I remember a long time ago that, that there are things like really believing in institutions at the time, like the BBC, like this is a thing. So it's kind of like a weird British patriotism thing where, you know, there have to be institutions that exist that benefit all of us. And then, you know, as you grow up, gradually becoming disillusioned with them or understanding how things are a lot more complicated than why can't we just do the right thing all the time? and how what you think is the right thing ends up being very different as you grow up. And you understand what the right thing means to different people and who doesn't get counted when we say what the right thing is. So I just had kind of more and more opportunities to do that. And I would say accidentally found, uh, I guess opportunity is the right thing because I had opportunities come up where that kind of, desire for the right thing to happen in the world combined with my love for tech we're able to kind of coincide so i like to say that i don't really have a career i have more of a careen i kind of fall into things <laughs> um and um so so i like to think that this kind of course of 
um, just caring deeply in a certain way <laughs> to a certain to my ability about people and how the world is combined with what I see about technology and the promise that technology should be able to bring, you know, over the last eight years or so, there's been quite a lot of disillusionment about, Mm -hmm. okay, well, you know, when I grew up, (laughs) we were supposed to get these things. And it turns out that they actually made quite a lot of other things worse. Mm -hmm. Um. Thank you for that for that context. It, listening to you describe that experience, it it reminds me that there's very much a generation of folks like us who were dissecting technology, for lack of a better mm-hmm. term, to to understand how it works and and um, to integrate it into our lives at a time when it was very early. Fast forward to today. And in many ways, that technology is now dissecting humanity, trying to figure out how it works and those kind of things. Can you talk a little bit about your point of view on, on <laughs> text, text integration with humanity and, and like where you see this next wave of kind of AI hype going? Um. Another think, easy question. Yeah, another easy question. Again, now, now it's it's only eleven fifteen now. Five minutes have passed. Since. I gave you time to warm up. <laughs> um, there's a good. Erin Kassane has been doing some great writing about. Um, I, I think an aspect of this right now, which is to deal with different social networks and looking at Mastodon, for example, and the Activity Pub Federated Network. Um, and one of the quotes that keeps coming up. Um, not just from her, but from a lot of people, a lot of people who do a lot of thinking in science and technology and society, um, is the quote that um, technology is neither good nor bad, it's neither good nor evil, but it's also not neutral. Um, And I think there were these, you know, I don't know if it was kind of like post-atomic age, but also weirdly set against the backdrop of nuclear winter in the 80s and 90s, where... It was technology is going to deliver us and it's going to deliver abundance and it's going to do all of this stuff, especially computers and software and all of that. And I think that the way to think about technology, the the easiest way has been to be that it's a tool, it's a thing that we invent or we discover and we invent to achieve aims that we set in place for ourselves or that aims that we're able to set so far as we can in the environment and systems that we're in and to the degree of agency that each of us has. Um, So when someone like Mark Anderson says software is eating the world, you know, he, he's kind of describing it as, well, we made a thing that can do that. And I'm going to use that thing to accomplish goals X, Y, Z. So it's really, it, as, as I get older and, and I, I feel like a lot of my, at least a lot of my friends or a lot of the people in the same bubble as me feel this way. It's like, well, technology, computer technology, software, stuff that allows you to do all of the maths very, very quickly at once, you know, massive operations at scale. Um, they let you do capitalism more and harder. That's, mm-hmm. that's kind of what it comes down to. Um, and you can put guardrails. Some states can choose to put guardrails on that or guide it or have principles around it. Um, but ultimately, I think it's this idea that the more data that we have about something, the more that we are able to control something. And I think I, I kind of offhandedly wrote about this the other day. It's like for people who are in their 40s now, you grew up and then when you're around you know, 8 to 14 years old, or six to 14 years old, you encounter a computer and then you can make it do stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, um, um, the Y Combinator chat talks about this. It's it's, It's the power of, you know, writing code and then feeling like you're a god and then stuff happens. And then inevitably, I feel like that desire is going to extend from the confines of the screen to the network and then to the wider world. And it's like, well, if I can control a computer this easily, then why can't I control? I want to be able to control the world that easily. Just a story about us ever since we've used fire or stone tools or whatever. Mm. Um, but then 
your question was about okay well what's it like when they when it tries to control us back or when it tries to understand us better and again i i kind of see one of those shortcomings as um it can only it <laughs> you know the data that goes into those models to the extent that we understand them and we're capable of understanding really complicated second third order effects and so on um it's only ever going to be as good as the data structures that can go into the model. And we've made some really naive assumptions about things like, you know, there's all these lists, you know, falsehoods programmers believe about names or dates or time um, and things. And as we try to pull more of the world into these models that we can manipulate, then there's just some, you know, there's a really easy joke that I can make about gender that used to be stored as a Boolean, right? Um, right. Or, um, or or gender is just a bunch of enums. Um, but really, you know, it's kind of becoming clear that it may as well just be a float or a series of floats or, <laughs> um, um, or, or something like that. So, and, and even then, you know, it's continuous and it changes over time. So it's, it's kind of there. We talk about building these applications, these apps and these services that we make increasingly in an effort to understand ourselves so that we can, I don't know, make more money or create more shareholder value or which, or, you know, um, afford healthcare for a relative who has cancer. <laughs> um, right. We, we do all these things and we kind of feed it all into it. And, and it seems to me that there's, there's always going to be this disconnect because it's just a fundamental disconnect between the world just isn't like that. The world is fuzzy and you can make certain predictions about it and they might get better, but you can never really get the certainty that um, a lot of us strive for or need, which might strive into mental health walk territory. Now that I come to think of it. <laughs> um, I, I was like trying to pick out something to not ask you the next question, just like deeply spiritual or mental health or, um, but you're making it difficult for me because you are talking about this in such a uh, transparent way. Uh, and I think it's something that a lot of people allude to things or avoid entirely. And I, I appreciate it. it. It's not often that I get to talk to, to a group of people uh, in my same age range that had the same experiences growing up. You grow mm. up with books. Like when I was a little kid, we'd go to the library and then I got a little bit older and my father started working in technology in the company that he was at and uh, computer devices started showing up. Mm -hmm. And like there were two kids in my household. One of them wanted to play games on everything. And then the other person wanted to literally dismantle. I wanted to dismantle everything <laughs> and put it back together. I just wanted to see what it looked like inside the case. Um, and I, so some of what you said, uh, and this reflects where I am as a human right now too, kind of like pushes me over to the spirituality side of things mm -hmm. because spirituality used to come from books and from oral tradition, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we would form groups and organizations. And it seems like, and I didn't know I was going here this morning when I woke up, <laughs> but this is where I'm going. It seems like, I don't want to use the word cult, but it seems like for lack of a better word, technology has allowed us to form these like cults and these sects and these groups of people that so deeply believe in something that we would have reserved for, like a real, I'm an Apple user and there's right. like the cult, there's the cult of Apple and yeah. like you know, the watch and then there's the computer and there's the iPhone and, um, and I don't have a spiritual religious belief in Apple, but like it touches and informs so much of my day-to-day -day life that I might as well. Um, I don't know if there's a question there. I might just be talking, but like, <laughs> I may have talked myself into a circle. I just wanted to know what your your thoughts are on that because you grew up in a very analog, analog little, and then all of a sudden the computers. And then once we get past just the computers themselves, we get into what that has meant for all of society to be connected through the computers and through the internet. So, yeah. 
What do you think? And then I'll let Rick ask you a really easy question or we'll talk about (laughs) mental health blocks. I honestly think we're not ready for everyone to be connected in the way that we have been. Yeah. Um, And, you know, which can sound super paternalistic um, because I also really want everyone to be ready. And I really think everything at the very least could benefit from being connected um, there was an essay I wrote a long time ago now about how, you know, if you'd gone back and you'd said, you, you're not going to believe me, but like over a billion people are going to be all online on the internet and they're going to be talking every day. Um, and they'll be doing it from their pocket, you know, the, the, the whole story. And, um, and if you go back and you tell 1990s me, then I'll be like, are you fucking shitting me? <laughs> like, yeah. really? Like, okay, that's awesome. Like, like if you put it in that way, it's kind of like we won. Like we we got what we wanted. Um, and to say that there was either naivety or or let's just call it optimism in what would happen. And this isn't by any way to discount all of the wonderful things that have happened because people have been able to talk to each other. But I think, especially with something like uh, like Twitter and what Elon has done to Twitter or what was already happening to Twitter and what was kind of already apparent with Facebook, I think, um, was especially with Facebook, there is no, you know, community of Facebook users when you get that big. Yeah. You know, there is nearly, I would say, a community of Redditors where there's kind of like a a kind of Redditor gestalt, um, which has been purposely um, guided by actual humans showing up like i think one of the big differences between facebook and reddit to there is the reddit is that reddit moderators show up and they talk in a user admittedly you know quite unprofessional and not really great for the company <laughs> tone of voice consistently <laughs> whereas whereas facebook is like no we're run as a business you know yeah. um and um and just the viability of a public square when we want well i say we <laughs> bunch of people want different things and the planet kind of isn't there yet and which isn't to say that there shouldn't be a public square but maybe the attempts to make it so are just so difficult that we're still at the stage of you know large groups that occasionally talk to each other and that where there's where there's overlap um i was going to say i mean on the spirituality side so i have I have two kids. I've got two boys. Um, our eldest is 10 and a half. And, um, and I mentioned that my parents moved over to the UK from Hong Kong in the seventies where they had you know, my brother. So we grew up in the UK and the UK for all of the Americans listening, um, is notable in having a state religion that no one believes in. Um, so, you know, everyone is normally, you know, a member of the church of England and, You've got the Anglican Church and, and all of that. And if you go to primary school, um, there are very high chances. Uh, I went to a regular non-religious primary school, so, you know, up to the age of 11. And you just sing hymns in the morning and it's just normal. All right. And it's it's not a big di- And And it's because it's like, because it's God. You know, what does God? God doesn't really, God's not real. <laughs> you know, we just, we just have to sing songs in the morning. <laughs> um, and then everyone kind of makes fun of it. Um, and, and it's just... You know, in the background, like the way Eddie is, art kind of makes fun of, fun of um, English vicars and all that kind of thing. And and the reason why I I bring this up is because now my kid is old enough that he's actually um, reading a lot more about Chinese history through young adult novels. Those young adult novels happen to be written by young authors who are themselves immigrants of Asian families who are trying to make sure that it's easier for other immigrant kids to assimilate and to feel like they belong because they never felt like they belonged anywhere. Um, Because one mode of immigration is, is when, you know, you've got parents who kind of double down on, on assimilation, right? So they don't want you to know anything about that. They kind of purposely, um, you know, not in a bad way, but, and it's not like they're intentionally concealing it, but like, but, perhaps your culture or your history or your traditions aren't really highlighted in that way. So I bring this up because I don't have 
um, I don't even know, for example, how observant or how spiritual my parents would be or are when they were growing up, you know, only to the extent that I remember when I was probably eight or nine going back to Hong Kong and then um, seeing my grandmother light some incense at um, where her um, where her dad was buried, I think. Um, so I think about that and I think about that kind of spirituality in you know, that kind of traditional spirituality. And then I think about having um, Mac OS release install parties where we would go to the Apple store in London and get together and then hang out in someone's flat and then all install the DVD or the multiple CDs as it was at the right. time, right? Um, onto uh, little white iBooks <laughs> or um, those flaky, flaky metal titanium power book G4s. Mm -hmm. and, um, and for that community, some of the people who hung out in that flat that night still hang out in a Slack right now. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of, one of the things that tech has let us done is, it, is it's let us bring a community with us rather than kind of be dispersed into the wind. Um, cause Cammy, it was when you were talking about Apple and it was like, okay, right. Well, you know, if I see another Apple person, then, you know, back in, I don't know, back in 2001, 2002, you could, you might see someone with white headphones on and you might say, ah, you've got an iPod too. <laughs> Whereas right yeah. now it's like, you've got an iPhone, like, you know, 200 million other people. Yeah. Um, right. so it does feel like, I, I, I don't know. I've never read bowling alone or anything. Um, my wife grew up in a small town in small towns in Midwest, in the Midwest to the extent that her family name, her family has, um, their name in one of the churches in the town church stained glass window. That's mm -hmm. how much integrated they are. And then my wife will say that she's not particularly religious, um, but what she did get was the community that that small church, um, congregation bought because everyone would go there. You would know about everything. You know, I have gone to, I've gone along to their services when they have them and they're all generally nice people apart from that one time when someone was accused of rape. Um, and then, you know, everything kind of closed up a bit. Mm. Um, there was a lot of disappointment, strong disappointment all around in terms yeah. of what it meant for standing up for people. Um, but we were talking about spirituality and uh, tech bringing us together. Yeah. Um, but that's the thing. When spirituality or tech brings us together, I mean, they're always horrible. We're humans. Humans right. sometimes do horrible things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Dan, you've touched on this a couple times, and so I want to just spend some time with it. Uh, recent, recent Internet history aside, the vast majority of all of our experiences online have been the written word, be it short form, long form, what have you. Uh, you've touched on your writing a couple of times, like as someone who has written online for a terribly long time, I'm always super impressed with not not only the amount of content you create but Prolific. the fact that that it always contains incredibly intelligent and cogent thought but also as a as a reader there's an inherent subtext of catharsis there. Like, oh my God. Yeah. I, I, I have to get this <laughs> off my chest. Right. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about writing and what that means to you. And like, has that always been part of your life? Is that, is that something new you found? Like just talk a little bit about writing. I'm pretty sure it's been, it's always been a part of my life. Like I can remember again, um, I could, you know, it's it's all those kind of like memories. Like I can remember childhood memories of um, writing stories on my dad's typewriter, um, and then progressing from a typewriter to a compact LTE two eight six in WordPerfect. <laughs> Actually, maybe oh, even Word before Perfect. that in uh, in WordStar um, on a different one, um, and wanting to write. You know, I think I've persistently for about. 
over 30 years now written really bad pastiches attempting to kind of write something a bit like Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> <My tones. laughs> it's like every single time I try to write something like that um, or I've been inspired by something like that. And honestly, it's actually taken me a great deal of therapy. Um, so, you know, maybe 20 odd years to even come close to admitting that I enjoy writing and it's nice and to be able to accept a compliment when people say that they like my writing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really interesting to kind of hold that denial alongside what, again, a therapist would point out to me is the clear evidence that I have to write just because of how much I write. Um, yeah. And, um, and, you know, and again, you know, I would kind of complain to my, to my wife and say, but I'm not a writer. You know, I have friends who are writers. And she's like, no, you're a, you're a writer. You have written, you have written a stupendous number of words. Um, you just don't do it in a form of a manuscript that is then finished and then sent to an agent or anything like that. Um, I have to uh, side with your wife on this one. You are a writer. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, so I've written when it was FTP in, mm -hmm. in Notepad and it was FTP uploaded to an FTP server and your web page had a tilde in it. Um, and I've written when it was Blogger and I've written when it was Movable Type and I've written when mm -hmm. it was WordPress. Um, and then I tried to get my head around static site generators and then just gave up. Um, <laughs> okay. And even GitHub pages on a, on a custom domain pisses me off every single time I try to do it. <laughs> um, I did tiny letter. Um, mm -hmm. you'll both know. So I started my, I started my newsletter on tiny letter when, um, I was bored out of my skull at Wyden. Um, and I was in one of those phases where all of our clients were just inter weren't had made clear that they weren't really interested in interactive work anymore. So I had a little bit more free time on my hands in um, in the office, and I did it as a way to both keep sane and also the way I told myself was it was just like a practice. It was just like, I'm going to see yeah. if I could do this five times. Uh, I'm going to see if I can do this every weekday. Um, and then, honestly, I get trapped by it. Um, so when when Substack came along, first Substack came along and then I got an email from this guy, Hamish, and he's like, I'm launching this new page newsletter thing. Do you want to try it? And I'm like, no, I've got a tiny letter. Why would I want to do that? It's weird. <laughs> and then six months later, he raises a bunch of VC and is like, oh, I've got still got this new Substack thing. Do you want to talk on Zoom or something about um, about how it might work? And I'm like, okay, fine, maybe. And then I'm on Substack for a bit. And honestly, one of the worst and nicest things has been people being able to pay me for the newsletter because mm -hmm. um, it is, you know, still legitimately surprising that anyone would do that, which, <laughs> again, my therapist likes because my therapist is like, but, Dan, this is cold, hard evidence that people actually value your writing. And I'm like, but it's shit, yeah. but they don't, but they disagree. <laughs> Your therapist likes the word evidence the way my therapist <laughs> likes the word evidence. There's no evidence of that. There yeah. is evidence of this. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and I think I needed to hear that today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it's the, and then at some point, and this happens, um, one thing that I've had to learn or kind of slowly had beaten into me is remission in mental health mm -hmm. um so i had a very very difficult um time and i went into intensive outpatient for i have no idea how long i don't know if it was six weeks or eight weeks or however long um and for people who don't know intensive outpatient is um when you don't want to be in hospital um and they agree that you don't have to be in hospital, but they really want you to be doing something. Um, so it's structure. It's a bit like daycare. <laughs> you go like, yeah. 
you get taken there four days a week and then you're with a group of other people and then you also do things like art therapy which was horrifying to me as someone who um thinks that they are terrible at visual art um and then suddenly be in a group with um you know 10 to 15 other adults and it's like okay now paint your feelings <laughs> like are you kidding me no <laughs> i wouldn't even <laughs> um i can design you a new um sign up flow <laughs> <laughs> an angry one can i do actually i would <laughs> I do wonder what um therapeutic design thinking would be like um mm. but um so i was i was talking about uh remission and relapse mm -hmm. um and one of the things that i learned there was that for the kind of people who are there you won't get better like it won't ever just go away and you won't be fixed and those are just bad words in the first place yeah. um but you get taught a lot of regulation tools you get taught to understand and notice things a lot better um and that there are a variety of ways that you can help yourself and that others can help you that are more effective than others just being concerned and saying you should do something um, are you okay are you okay and then right and then so it can get to the point where you're like can you get me an ice pack please because I think this time an ice pack is really going to help. help. Um, and, and the thing that they taught me was that you will relapse, like you will do great, and then you will relapse. And then our goal is that those relapses will become less frequent and they will become less intense and that they will not last as long. And the thing that I've seen, especially with stuff like depression and anxiety, is that when I don't care enough, I can write again. And, and right now I am in one of my, you know, being terrified of writing phases mm -hmm. um, because I have not written in my newsletter for a few months now. Um, yep. And, um, and then, you know, so then all of that, all of that fear builds up. So it's been, I've written, yes, Rick. I've written a lot on <laughs> on the internet, um, and sometimes it is easy, and sometimes it is hard. Uh, and um, I have been very lucky in that ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time, I have not had to take any shit for it. Mm -hmm. Like in yep. incredibly lucky about yeah. that, and and not just not taking shit for it, not not having taken shit for it, but also it opened up a whole bunch of opportunities. Yep. So we ripped the mental health bandaid off. <laughs> Let's talk about stupid walks for your stupid mental health. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who don't follow Dan <laughs> on the social medias, he posts selfies of himself taking walks for his mental health, stupid walks, stupid walks, stupid mental health. Probably. And it is one of my favorite things. So how did that come to be? Um, I have poor impulse control. <laughs> good, good. I thought it would be funny. And then I did another. So first they started out, I think, as a bit of accountability. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not quite sure who to. And also because it's social media, so there's always like that underlying performative, like, look at me, look at what I'm doing. Yeah, I'm um, struggling with that very much right now with accountability versus performative behavior. Right. Yeah. Um, and actually, so I talked to my therapist about that as well, and we had a fascinating conversation. Um, because at some, like sometimes, I do one so that I can post it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I go on a walk because I, at that time, I really feel like I need to go on a mental health walk. Um. And then I st actually, no, I think I pretty much did do them for external validation because it's like amongst a lot of my friends, a lot of people I know and a lot of people who follow me know that going on a mental health walk is a good thing and is a helpful thing. So it's, it's kind of like if you post that you're going on a mental health walk, you must be in a pretty shitty cesspit of the internet if your replies are go fuck yourself, what are you doing? <laughs> right. right. Yeah. And it's right. more likely that people are gonna say, Hey, well done, good job, you got out of the house. Right. Yeah. Yep. So it was probably 
some of that, like, hey, I want a pat on the back um, for doing something that is hard and doing something that other people also understand is hard. Um, and then I would be lying if I said there wasn't also some mugging for the camera to try and look as annoyed about the whole thing <laughs> as possible. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you are angrily going on a mental, a stupid mental health walk sometimes because it fucking works. <laughs> and what is up with that? <laughs> which, which again, felt like a, you know, a particular subtype or personality, you know, growing up with computers in the 80s and 90s, you're like, oh, no, I wish I didn't have to cart around my brain in this stupid body. I wish I didn't have to think about my body. I hate my body. Why can't I just be my brain? Yeah. Um, and then being forced to consider that maybe your body is important and it would be good to have something that can carry your brain around in as well as possible. Um, and um, I have been very encouraged about the people who now send me pictures of them going on stupid mental health walks. Mm -hmm. um, and the conversation with my therapist was along the lines of, so I went on this thing and I posted it and people replied and I liked it. And I'm not sure if it's good if I do it for the external validation. And then my therapist, I'll kind of summarize was like, are you fucking ridiculous? Um, <laughs> like, you're doing something that is, that is objectively good for you that multiple professionals have told you that is good for you. There's peer reviewed research that says that this is good for you. Um, you get something out of it. You're inspiring other people to do it, and they're telling you that they've done it. And you think that this, and you have found a way to feel bad about this. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had a more productive conversation about that than, than <laughs> kind of the than kind of the accusatory one. Um, but you know, even even thinking about it that way was like, isn't it interesting how easily and quickly something can be turned around yeah. um, in your head? Um, so then he was like, well, you can look at the posts from people who say like, all they're saying is thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. Or all they're saying is, is good job. Like if you just read it for what it is, yeah. if you look at the evidence, then, um, and also thoughts are just thoughts and they just go away. They're not, they're not true. I was going to say, what? if, if yeah, I have ahead. to be doing the mental health things that I'm doing for myself for the right reasons, I am never going to be in a better place. I have yeah. to do them for whatever reason I'm able to do yeah. them. Um, and so just as someone who appreciates your example, I'm going to say thank you again. Thanks. You're welcome. Rick, go ahead. Well, yeah, I just wanted to <laughs> touch on or because I, I really appreciate it as well. And, um, for folks, because I know language is very important to you and, and you kind of like categorizing these activities specifically as stupid mental health walks, like for his maybe stupid mental us, health, yes. for his stupid mental yeah. health. Yeah. But because like, of my stupid brain. Yes. yes. Yeah. In, in, and because, the, the, and the, because they in stupid the carrying work. vehicle that yeah. you they want to be too. better for your brain. Yeah. Um, maybe just describe like, are there certain aspects that make a stupid mental health walk different than just going for a walk like is it is like mm. is there a like if i'm walking to do something does that disqualify it from being a stupid mental health walk because there's an intended outcome from it like or is it just any time i'm able to get out and get active it helps my mental health from your from your perspective from my perspective, it's any, it's a continuum and it's not discrete. Mm -hmm. yep. So I would say that it is better if, so any, so any, uh, someone replied to me with a t-shirt that I think they have like a, it's like a catch to 5k type thing, but, and their shirt is like any distance is a good distance. So yep. I'm like, yes, I, I totally get behind that. Especially if you're at a stage where, you know, getting outside for five minutes, getting outside for three minutes. I, <laughs> you know, and the any, any N is a good N um, mm -hmm. perspective. I, um, I'm friends. I think I'm friends. I'm definitely internet friends. 
um, with a well-known writer, and um, they we were talking about Pomeranda. I was talking about I, my my ADHD coach got made me get these sand timers so that I can do shit. Um, <laughs> And, I and it, re- mine is right there. Yeah, and and, <laughs> um, and like, and they go down to one minute, right? And she's like, one minute. <laughs> and then there's this person. I have I have multiple of their books in my in my bookcase to my right. Um, and they're like, they set a Pomodoro timer for five minutes, or no, wait, no, for thirty seconds to start writing. Wow. Sometimes, and I'm like, are you like thirty seconds? Now I feel less bad. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so I'm very much on any distance is less dense is, is good distance. I feel better if I don't look at my phone mm-hmm. while I'm doing it. I mm-hmm. honestly feel like, especially I became such of a shut in during COVID. Um, like I didn't go to my co-working space anymore, which meant that I didn't have to walk or ride a bike. Um, you know, we didn't go to stores anymore. So it's entirely conceivable that I could spend, you know, many, many hours in, you know, without or days, just without leaving the house. Mm-hmm. Um, so even just getting outside and just getting the sunlight um, helps. The The types of walks that we did in, in IOP um, were also kind of around noticing so just looking at things differently and there's like grounding techniques that like sometimes work like you know what are five things that you can see what are four things that you can hear and, and stuff five like that senses check-in is one right. of my all-time personal favorites <laughs> day goes by that i haven't used it i'm not really sure what's happening um and and also because i i find that at least if I'm genuinely angrily doing a stupid or resentfully doing a stupid mental health walk within about a minute, it's a really good reminder of how emotions aren't permanent and they can just go because suddenly within about a minute, it's like, Oh wait, where did that go? I'm suddenly on a different thing in, in most, in most cases. So um, I'm very much on the, um, annoyingly apparently your body influences what your brain feels and does <laughs> the brain is more important why does the body right. get to say yeah <sighs> so so yeah i, I think it doesn't I, I think in the grant i don't think I, I don't think the reason matters okay cool thank you that's helpful all right I'm just going to go ahead and say I've been trying to be mindful of the length of our episodes and <laughs> picking up our guests' time, and we are at the point where we need to switch over to our lightning round. Okay. If everyone is ready, because I feel like we could talk to Dan about any one of the topics that we've broached for another six <laughs> hours. So I will go ahead and, and uh, formally ask you to come back on the show and ask you cool. if you will be our stupid mental health walk expert sure i'll, I'll be the, the the stupid mental health work correspondent yes the senior, correspondent senior senior senior, senior, yeah, senior yeah, correspondent senior for course, stupid senior. mental health yeah. walks for yeah. stupid mental yes. health. all right yes. daily show yes. style yes, yes exactly that exactly. is where our senior <laughs> correspondents come from all right i'm going to dive into the questions i'm going to okay. ask you four i'm going to roll first we're going to roll this die okay over here it's behind my t and i'm supposed to answer quickly yeah what but if you, you get if you get go ahead it's nine nine so if you get stuck okay you're allowed to pass oh okay but but we will come back to it okay so there's no right. there's no time right. limit okay. so you you can't avoid the question but you can right. at least press pause all right just jotting down your additional question cool this is a change to the format, by the way. Oh, okay. Before we we would have this awkward pause after four questions. Oh, and, uh, yeah. So now we've got now it's going to flow. Just five questions. Boom. I'm boom, working boom. on yeah. it. I'm working on it. Okay. Nice. Dan, what one habit would you like to pick up over the next year? Oh yeah. Um, wait, no. <laughs> 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 I, I thought I had a really quick answer for it, which was um, 
I want to be able to run Cat5 cabling and patch holes, but that's not a habit. I mean, if that were a mm. habit, then that would be dangerous in a way. It would be dangerous. <laughs> um, so I'll say um, a habit is I want to be better at putting away stuff after I do DIY. Nice. Nice. Put stuff DIY away episode. as soon as I finish using it. I struggle with that as well. Mm. Yeah, for sure. All right. Question number two. Would you like to know a lot about one thing or a little bit about a lot of things? Mm. <laughs> oh. <sighs> a lot about one thing. Okay. Okay. What do you need from the grocery store? Gluten-free bread. Oh, are you gluten-free too? No. Oh, okay. But, so, but someone in this house is. Okay. <laughs> gluten-free bread. New Cascadia, by the way, in yeah. case you're not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. New yeah, Cascadia. The brand stuff is all right, but then New yeah. Cascadia stuff is. New mm -hmm. Cascadia stuff is the good, as long as you toast it or something. Mm-hmm. Okay, question number four. Would you like to survive the zombie apocalypse? Yes, because I think it'd be hilarious. Yes! <laughs> because, because the joke is, is like, okay, unless I learn a whole bunch of new skills, then what use is being able to write a good PowerPoint strategy? <laughs> there you go. Um, but um, we, so we, we send our kids to, um, uh, our kids go to outdoor school. Um, so they know how to build shelters and start fires and things. Mm -hmm. So they are our, um, you know, a lot of people have kids who look after them in old age. And we decided that that needs to include the zombie apocalypse. So I love your household. Your family is mm -hmm. fantastic. This it's, is, this it seems is very 99% practical. my wife. It is very practical. Yeah. She's delightful. I've never even met her and I can <laughs> tell you she's delightful. All right. Question number five. What did five-year-old Dan want to be when he grew up? I'm going to have to say writer now because I kind of painted myself into that corner earlier. You did. Yeah, you did. All right. You, you have mastered the lightning round. Five questions. You flew right through them. Yeah. And now I say... Thank you so much for joining us on this show. We have been super excited. Like you don't know this, but we've been whispering <laughs> about getting you on the show since the very early days. When can we, when can we bring Dan on? Bring I, I hey, told, hey. <laughs> I told my kids last night um, that um, they were going to have to be quiet this morning because I was going to be doing a podcast and, and our 10 year old was, Oh, wow. You're going to be like, so, cause, cause they look at YouTube now they're, they're aware. Sure. And it's like, what, yeah. which one are you going to be on? It's like, Oh, it's this thing uh, called mildly interesting people. And then he looked at me and he goes, that's right. You are mildly interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're wildly interesting. You let him know the mildly interesting people said that you're wildly interesting. <laughs> All right. At this point, I ask Rick to wrap this up with a pretty bow. Sure. Uh, happy to. Uh, Dan, I was lucky enough to you know, work in close proximity with you for a number of years and, and had the chance to not only engage with you professionally, but also on a, a purely creative level from time to time. And, and I will always cherish those memories I didn't even bring up gamification. I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna. <laughs> try you just that. did. Yeah. You Next just time. brought it up. <laughs> no. uh, but I just always found you to be uh, genuine, forthright, and and absolutely passionate about whatever it is that has your current focus. Mm -hmm. And I've just been um, really thankful to follow along in your journey, not only about working through um, the, your mental health, but also just like you as a person and what you bring to our internet and to this world. Like you, you are a writer, you are putting powerful thoughts out there and, and I will be forever thankful for it so thank you for joining us on the show we really appreciate it thanks rake thanks cammy thanks dan 
Bye, everyone. Bye.